Tom Hughes, then... No, we're we're we were so you, you fell on it by chance. We did, so we left Bishop to do this thing, and we yeah. went up uh, with children. Oh, and then right. Harry and I did a little ceremony up on Monster Hill at the same time that... Oh, oh, oh wow. ...that no, Bishop really? was doing his magic thing. Right. I saw the photos of the, of the Bishop doing... And, and what are the chances? Okay. Well, destiny. You see, the patterns that form DNA also. Well, Susie actually gone to the church. Susie, to, yeah, she actually gone to the she church. She was there, yeah, I heard. With um, <coughs> Richard Stanley, the director. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, he spoke last year. He can't be here this year, Sally. Yes, he's, he's, he's um, yeah. post production. Okay, so I'm going to just do a few more and then I'm going to stop halfway and then hand over to Tori because otherwise we're going to get over time. So, my question is as a historian, where are the Cathar archives? I immediately go to the libraries if I'm trying to solve a historical puzzle. Who's kept the minutes of all of that? We have this Bishop of Pamiers records there. They were kept. But they tell it from the Catholic side. Where's the, where's the Cathar equivalent records? Who's found them? Were, they, were any kept? It said they smuggled documents out of Mossack or just before the fall. Where are they? So I've taken on a mission with Jeff Merrifield, who spoke last year, and Rich Stanley, who's a bit of an expert in the region, to compile a, um, a bibliography, a, like an archive guide to the region of Cathars. Because a lot of local historical societies have gathered books. Some, some um, you know, determined researchers have sprung up and set up their own houses to have a study center, and there are private libraries which have amassed lots of information. Um, and there is there's a, um, you know, a CAFA research center as well. So my idea, and I don't think anybody's done this, is simply compile a list of all the libraries and the archives for scholars who want to come to the region, you know, come and stay here or wherever, and then spend a few weeks or a month studying all this stuff, because it's priceless. And also when people die, what happens to their collections? Are they dispersed or the grandchildren come along and sell them off? You know, I think somebody should be at least um, collating them. Um, and it's hard to find the records of the losers in any war. The victors are the ones that keep writing the history, but I think we have a duty. I want to also just mention briefly, um, it's interesting this cosmopolitan route to freedom of the Pyrenees came back in World War II. The Nazis uh, were a particularly unpleasant anti-Semitic, we want to monopolize everything kind of movement, led by an ill-educated corporal and his cronies. Um, and um, you know, they represented the sort of anti-intellectuals of the day. Um, but they had a few, a scattering of pseudo-intellectuals, girls had a PhD and a few others, Otto Rahm was a kind of intellectual. He was fascinated by Monsignor God mysteries. And they, of course, wanted to seize the spiritual energy of this place and use it for their own racist agenda, which was totally like the wrong motive. You're not allowed into Castle Monsal back if you have the wrong motivation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, but what happened was the um, a lot of the um, people who opposed Nazis wanted to flee to Spain and to escape. And there were routes through the Pyrenees Mountains that the resistance, the Maquis, knew. And they conducted them. Um, one of the most famous was Walter Benjamin, the great Jewish philosopher, who died because he was taken halfway up the mountain. And uh, they told him, you can't get through today. The snow is too bad. You've got to get back down. And he said, I can't, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to sit here. I, I'm not doing that climb again died. Um, and he was one of the greatest Jewish thinkers of the 20th century, like George Steiner, who's the living equivalent. So these resistance workers, now people are researching that. They found what's called the Chemin de la Liberté. Between 1940 and 1944, 33,000 successful escapes took place, guided by French resistance people across the Pyrenees. And the and the Americans came to help as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm coming to that. <laughs> yes. Um, there was a concentration camp here at Le Vernet, near Pamiers, interestingly enough. 
um, <clears throat> where they would round up all the Jews from the region and then stick them in a concentration camp and then ship them on by train to Auschwitz and places. Um, in June 1944, the last internees were evacuated and deported to Dachau. In total, about 40,000 people of 58 nationalities were interned there. <clears throat> Not just Jews, but, but all undesirable socialists, whatever. You know. um, intellectuals. Yeah, intellectuals, basically. <laughs> and um, so there are people, historians, who are now studying all this. There's a book that's out about these, these resistance workers. And there was a, an American guy um, called um, Paul Swank, born in 1921, who um, joined the American army and he joined the OSS which was doing dangerous missions abroad <clears throat> and he ended up um, parachuting into this region the in the Horde. Right. And um, he, he was killed in action just here in Alet in, on August the 11th, um, August 17th, 1944. And he's buried at the Alley of the Pass. Do you know originally his body was taken by the people of Alet? So the only reason I know this is next week, Barbara, his Paul's cousin, is arriving here. She's just written his book, his oh. biography. Oh. So the, the people of Alet took his body yeah. and they took it up to the church in San Silvestre and they kept a vigil up there. Oh. And it was after then, the death? After he was killed. And yeah. then his death, then his body was then taken and he was buried in Esperanza with a Frenchman. Until after the war, then he was exhumed, fled back to America, had a full military ceremony. Mm -hmm. But he wanted his dying wish was to die where, or to be buried where he found. He was then exhumed again, Gosh. brought back, and he's buried on the road here. Huh. So, wow. Yeah. So, and they still mm -hmm. commemorate his. The French are really good at commemorating yeah. the war resistance. We have. But you talk story. about concentration camps, and the first people to ever build concentration camps were the British. Were the British. Yeah. No, I know. So, yeah. Yeah. Sure, in, in the ball. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to finish with um, the last one before I hand over the torch. Is um, <clears throat> I want to talk about Catalan culture and its importance. Again, it's, it's um, just here on the frontier. And um, Girona is in Catalonia. And I made contact with a professor at the University of Barcelona, who again I invited late to speak. Yeah. He's just done a PhD thesis on witchcraft in the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. um, he's a professor of medieval history at the University of Barcelona. And he's discovered from the records that the first witches who were persecuted and, and tried and convicted were here in the Pyrenees, in the whole of Europe. The Pyrenees witch hunts began the whole pan-European witch hunts. And he's done what um, Jacques Fournier did. He's gone through all the records of the trials and inquisitions into these witches. He's discovered that 90% of them were women, and most of them were convicted on testimony from their neighbours. Surprise, surprise. This is what happened in the witch trials in Britain and in Germany, which was you know, all over Europe. But it began here in the Pyrenees. Do you know when? when yes, it? yes, I do. I've got the dates. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that in more detail in my second half. Um, but I just want to flag up that the Catalonian culture is very interesting, it's sort of independent, it's midway between French and Spanish. Um, and one of my intellectual heroes, Raymond Lull, who was a great mystic of Christian esoteric thought, he studied Sufism, he lived in the um, sort of 1200s, around the time everything was kicking off. And um, he, he, um, he was a philosopher who believed in illumination, like he was saying earlier about these people at the Institute of Emerging Sciences. They're academics, but they want something deeper and brighter, like an illumination as well. This guy is called Doctor Illuminatus in the tradition of you know, it's different doctors of the church. And he wrote <coughs> books, he called it The Great Art, which he produced kind of numerology and God knows what, you know, Kabbalistic type stuff. He studied the Kabbalah. And um, interestingly enough, the person that discovered California, who was a Spanish-Mexican professor of philosophy called Fray Junipero Serra, uh, from Mallorca originally. Mallorca is a Catalan-speaking region, and 
Raymond Dollars from New York. Um, and this Fray Junipero Serra was a, a Catalan, a New Yorker philosopher who held the chair of Raymond Lowell philosophy in, in uh, you know, uh, Palma at the time, I think, who didn't want to have to go to the New World at all. He was appointed by uh, had to go found the University of Mexico. And then he was sent up to found California. And he named Los Angeles, San Diego, probably Monterey. I think. And Carmel. He's, he, he named Carmel as well. Yeah. Yes, and he that's the church that I belong to. Right. And he's buried in the church. Is he? Yes. And um, he was assigned, which it is a beautiful beach, but it was really nothing when he arrived. There were Native Americans. Yeah. Um, there were some battles between the Native Americans and the, yeah. and the Spanish monks. Um, but that church yeah. has um, power in it. Well, look at the Raymond Lowell connection. That's the root of the man's power. And I, I have a movie on my sleeve about his life story starting in New York. The Lullian connection, that would be a great thing to do. So, look, um, so Catalan, you know, um, is part of this incredible rich mixture of esoteric thinking and philosophical depth. So, that's why I'm excited about this region, why it's lovely to be here. Okay, um, I'm going to save my other remarks for later because. Um, we don't want to run too late, and we have to hear from our next year speaker, Tori. So thank you so much. We'll stop there. Okay.